begin in uh, Revelation 19.11. I'm going to read the rest of this chapter, then back up and make some comments on it. And then we will uh, use chapter 20. Next week we will finish the book of Revelation. And I'm not quite sure where the group is going to go from there, but uh, I'm sure they'll be discussing it before we're finished with Revelation. But they, they talk some of uh, going back to Genesis. There's the usual pattern is uh, they go back to one of the Gospels and start over. I think it took five years to get from one of the Gospels to here. Maybe we did two Gospels meanwhile. But uh, So if you don't get everything you need out of this, hang around for five years and <laughs> we'll be at this station again. Okay. All right. In 1911, I, I love these first words, Now I saw heaven opened. How would you like to be there? Uh, now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen and white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both great and small. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of the fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him, who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. <clears throat> you know, when Jesus uh, came the first time, <clears throat> he, he came as uh, a suffering servant. You know, the prophets predicted that. He would come as one who was to reveal to all mankind the nature of God, reveal to all mankind the purpose of God for man on earth, <clears throat> And so he was born of a virgin, born as a child, grew up and suffered all of the um, indignities and difficulties of being a child, growing into an adult. And then as an adult, uh, his uh, persona, his message was rejected by the uh, religion of that time. They didn't believe that he was who he said he was, and they chose to refuse him and would not let him into their circles. And so he was kind of caught between, you know, uh, his humanity and his divinity. And even though he was uh, the son of God, he suffered all of the indignities and the problems of humanity that anybody would suffer, that most of us have suffered. Um, the rejection, the heartaches, and so forth. And, and as he came as the first one, he, he chose people to walk with him and to learn of his... Uh, message. And, and actually, uh, those 12 men or those disciples were commissioned to carry his message into all of the world. And we're here today because they succeeded. The disciples succeeded in carrying the message into all the world. And here we are. We're talking about that today. And there, there's, there's no greater message on earth for us to share with others than the message of Jesus Christ, the one who came from God, 
who was sent from God. He lived and he died among us and was resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven. There's no greater message on earth of hope and encouragement than that message. And it's through that message that all men gain access to God. And here we see <clears throat> the second time Jesus comes, he's not Mr. Nice Guy anymore. He is uh, one who brings uh, the judgment of God. See, God offered his love. But many who did not receive his love stand to uh, face his wrath. And that's what we're reading about here. His wrath is correct, it's just, it's righteous, because he has offered salvation to every man on the face of the earth. I don't believe there's a person who in some way or some fashion has not understood that there is one above us who is greater than we are, and that there is a place for him or her in that relationship if they will accept it. I believe his, his grace and his mercy has extended to everybody on the earth because God loves everybody. There, there's no exception. God loves everyone. And even people who have not heard the gospel as we have heard it have some form of worship and adoration for someone who's beyond them, you know, one, as one African put it so well, he said, we're worshiping its, we're worshiping bushes, and we're worshiping trees, and we're worshiping rocks, and God is not an it. God is a him. So please, would you reveal yourself to me? And this guy said that one day a white woman came walking into his village with a black book under her arm, and he rushes toward her because he sensed that she had something to share What's his name? What's his name? And she led him to Jesus because that is his name. See? And now we're here to see him at, on a white horse coming from heaven to exercise the wrath and the justice of God upon all of the people who have plenty of opportunity to say yes to Jesus but would not. They reject him. And I think it's interesting when I see this that Earlier in the book, there was a guy on a white horse, but he was not the real Jesus. He was somebody else. So there are, there are going to be fakes coming, people who say they are going to bring the justice of God to earth. But notice like in verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire. And I've tried to visualize that, you know, what that would mean to face Jesus who had eyes like flames of fire. And perhaps you've seen people that uh, when you look into their eyes, it, it seems like they can look right through you. It seems like they can look right into your soul and know what you're thinking. Well, when I think of the eyes which were like flames of fire, you know, when, they, when you look into those eyes, you will either fall down in worship or in submission because those eyes are the eyes of the one who created us like flames of fire. And we know what flames of fire can do. And it says, on his head were many crowns. And then he had a name written that no one knew except himself. It said this name was written down the side of his robe and down his leg. Uh, and it was called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's not one of the king among kings. He is not one of the lords among lords. He is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of lords. And that's fairly emphatic to me, that there, was, uh, there is no one like him. And after it announces what he's going to do, it says, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. So it's the word coming out of his mouth that subdues the nations. Uh, you know, some believe that the saints will wield their swords in this period of time, and there's been times that seemed like a plausible thing that would happen at the end of time. But if you read this carefully, the, the saints don't swing the sword. They follow. And it's the words coming out of his mouth that actually destroys the nations. So the same God who said, let there be light and there was light, can also say, let there be damage and there will be damage. There will be utter damage to those who do not believe and do not accept and then I saw this angel standing, and he said to the birds of the air, he says, come on, you're, we're, you're going to have a feast. See, there's a feast in heaven, but there's going to be a feast for the carrion on earth. It's the 
flesh and the blood of all of these people who fall, all of the people who come against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And with his mouth he will slay them. And so their, their bodies will be scattered all through the earth. And so he's calling the birds of prey to come, come, and let, your, let yourself be filled with the flesh of men and horses and animals and so forth. It's kind of a gruesome scene, is it not? Uh, if you've ever watched a hawk uh, capture a, uh, a bird or a mouse and uh, stand there with his uh, claw around that mouse or bird and then with his beak just tear it apart bit by bit and consume it, it just doesn't take very long for that hawk to consume a lot of flesh. And, and we can imagine what a horrible, horrible scene this would be for anybody who has life in them to witness it. But it's very real. It says that it's the, the damage and the, and the judgment upon the people of the earth is going to be very thorough. Those who have not accepted Jesus will be caught up in this. Those who come against him and think that they can conquer him with numbers. See, that's foolish. They think they can conquer God with numbers. And they cannot do it. And then, meanwhile, the beast was captured and the false prophet who worked signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. See, man promises a lot of things that they're going to do. Uh, I, I don't like the political sessions because I know that uh, the people who make a lot of promises, I don't care who they are or what stripe they are, they make a lot of promises, but they haven't been up there in that city uh, we call Washington, D.C., our capital. They don't know what the lobbyists are like. They don't know what the minions are like that lurk the halls and try to influence the minds of those who go. And it seemed like some who maybe go with pure motives in a few years, where did those, where did those promises go? What were you like then and what are you like now? And, and so the armies of the earth think that they can make promises to man, gather man together, and actually defeat God. What a foolish idea. What a foolish idea. Uh, concept they have. And it says in verse 21, it's very conclusive, and the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's very conclusive, that it is Jesus, the one who came meek and lowly riding on a donkey, the foal of a donkey, now comes on a white horse, and the sword out of his mouth can conquer anything on the face of the earth. It's awesome. It's awesome. We ought to consider that. Then we move on to uh, chapter 20. Let's read that. Um, let me have a drink before I read. Chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have been expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, the good news of this chapter is that Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. That's, that's an awesome thing to contemplate. Um, you know, if this is a period of time when Satan is bound and man is expected to live before his creator, uh, how will that work? Um, I've, been, I've wondered about this particular phase of our existence a lot of times. And to me it connects back to the beginning of time when God created Adam. You know, there was, a, there was a plan for Adam and Eve in the garden that was brought short. Why? Why was their existence in the garden brought short? It was because of sin. It was because of sin. And, and at sin, they, their life ended. Now, Adam was uh, 930 years old when he died. You know, just a little short of uh, 1,000. And I've always felt that there's something that was lacking in Adam and Eve's relationship with God, that mankind somehow is going to try to, re God's going to recreate and fulfill at the end of time. So this, this thousand years kind of fits into that scheme, and several commentators I've read allude to that fact, that uh, there's something about the thousand years that links back to Adam. This is the only place in the Bible this is actually mentioned it's not really mentioned anywhere else, a thousand years. And most people interpret this to be a thousand years literally. And that's the way I've always been taught, that it's a thousand years literally that we would be upon the face of the earth. But whatever the time is, the important fact is this, that those who exist in that time, their, their concept of right and wrong will be uh, locked within themselves according to what kind of relationship they have with God. And I don't know about you, but if Satan is not there to tempt us, uh, can we, will we be able to really live with God in a peaceful way for a period of time, for say like a thousand years? And will I be alive the whole thousand years? I, I don't really know. But I know I am alive eternally because I know Jesus Christ. So whatever this period of time is, God has already made provisions for us that we can exist and live in such a time as this, and that we can understand his ways with us more fully then than we can now. I don't know about you, but as I think of myself, you know, being transported from this life into that life, uh, I don't think sin goes away that easy, you know, my, in myself, in my own thinking. But God has some plan here that he is going to exhibit to all people who live through, the, through this period of time, that it is possible without Satan's intervention, it is possible for man and woman to live in relationship to God in a healthy relationship that is blessed. That is blessed. And, and the, the systems of the world are going to be brought to a halt, brought to a stop. Uh, I, I've often wondered what, what will we do, you know. Uh, I pretty much rely on the systems of the present to exist. I mean, it's nice to go to the grocery store and get groceries. It's nice to drive up to the gas station, fill your car up with gas. But I read here later in Revelation that the tree of life is going to be in the middle of the garden. Now, what's the tree of life? It says it yields fruit in every, every month. Yields fruit every month. So what, what will be the grocery store? Well, the tree of life looks to me like it's going to be the grocery store. What's going to be our source of, of uh, uh, social life among us? Well, it's going to be our relationship with God, first of all, and then relationship between all of us that is made perfect because of his presence. Uh, sin is gone. Satan is bound. 
And so we can live it up for a period of time before God, like Adam and Eve did before the fall. I don't know. That's always been a part of my thinking of why we needed this period of time called the millennium at the end of time. Because eventually I'm going to live, well, I am living in eternity now. I just don't understand what it is. The only part I understand is the part that I have lived since I was born some years ago and to the present. And I'm not sure I understand all of that, but I know something about that period of time. But I don't know much about the period of time which we call eternity, except it's with God and it'll be with him forever and ever and ever. So I don't know what you think about this. Uh, I don't know how you uh, chain a spirit. It says the devil is going to be chained. I don't know how you chain a spirit. So there's things I don't understand. But I do understand this, that God who loves us has a plan for us. And he's going to put us in a position where we can relate to him perfectly. I'm looking forward to that, even though I don't understand that. And what that means for every believer, I don't know. Uh, You know, Jesus said in some of his parables that if we're faithful in a little here, we will be placed over much in this period of time. And I presume it's the period of time that we call the thousand years or the period of time when our relationship with God basically exists because God has created a time when we can relate to just to him without the devil being present, without the devil uh, throwing thoughts in our mind to cause us to take advantage of our fellow man or to blaspheme the God Almighty that we all love. So there you are, the thousand years, And then it says at the end of those thousand years, Satan will be released for a little time, maybe to test us to see if there is yet sin in us, if it can be brought out, if sin can be brought out. My prayer would be that would be for about five minutes, but I don't know how long that'll be. Uh, Because, you know, I'm concerned that there are things in me that would last an eternity. I don't know. But God has a plan that's really mysterious to me about this thousand years, this, maybe it's a preparation time for eternity. Maybe it's uh, to bring conclusion to the things that we've depended upon on earth that we thought were so important to us. And during this period of time, we'll realize that those things that we thought important are not important. I don't know. But, but it certainly is a blessing that we have this, these couple of chapters here at the end of Revelation to describe to us something about the transition between this life and eternity. But, but I, can, I can guarantee you from what I know about the Word, there's going to be some big things done during this period of time. And we ourselves need to just to prepare our hearts to be ready for whatever God offers us in that period of time when these big things are accomplished. You know, the whole world is in turmoil at this point, Yeah. The whole world is in turmoil. And of course, in the last chapters, we read that he brings a new heaven and a new earth, uh, which gives me hope, because I've always been concerned about the destructive things that we've done to the earth. You know, the chemicals that we throw in the earth, the things that we've done to the sea, the stuff we've dumped in the sea in the name of getting rid of our trash, our junk, our refuse. I've always been concerned about that. I've lived on a farm, and I can see what destroyed soil looks like, soil that will no longer produce anything because of the chemicals or whatever was thrown there. Uh, You know, the oil that we spilled in the Gulf, they say a lot of that lays on the bottom yet in some form. What does that do to my shrimp? You know, Uh, I don't know. But it says we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. That's, That's encouraging. And we'll get into that in the last couple of chapters. But this period of time here which is a transition from when the forces of earth rule the earth and when God Almighty intervenes and brings everything to a point of justice and of of correction like the world has never seen. That is something that, that we look forward to. And it says that those of us who believe in Jesus Christ will prevail with him through all of that. And we will prevail with him beyond that. And we will prevail with him throughout an eternity. What is an eternity? 
Well, it's something that has no beginning and no end. I do know that. But what it looks like from this vantage point, I don't know. But I know he knows. And you know where my trust is? My trust is in him. That wherever he is, that's where I would like to be. See, my heart's desire is to be doing the things that he says to me, speaking the things that he says to me, and doing the things that he is doing, because that is the safest place to be in the world, you know? Jesus himself said, that's what I do. Jesus prayed a lot. He prayed more than perhaps anybody on the earth at that time, yet he came from God, but he prayed a lot. And he said, when I pray to the Father, I just say the things he tells me to say, and I do the things I see him doing. So let's pray that we will hear God's voice. Let's pray that as we hear his voice, we will go where he tells us to go, do the things he tells us to do, because that's the safest place to be. Beyond that, I don't know what preparation a Christian can make. I can't think of any greater thing to do. But as you look around you every day, there are, there are needs and one never knows what an act of kindness, an act of reaching out to another person will do for that person. You never know. You know? We, I, I've heard so many testimonies of just by a simple act of kindness. Somebody's life has been touched, totally run, turned around. So our command is to love one another. And we can all do that, can't we? There's someone we can love. You know, besides our family, we can love someone. We can see needs and we can love that person. And maybe that's what that person lacks more than anything else, is someone to love them. And I'm always encouraged by people who see a need and go and try to be a, of help to that person. Not to be in the way, not to control the person, but just to be of help. Just to listen and see where you could fit in. And that's not difficult for anybody to do. It doesn't take any training. It doesn't take any schooling. It just takes eyes to see and ears to hear. And so many people just need someone who will listen to their story. When you listen to their story, I'm sure you will find something that you can do. Okay? So let's be listeners. Listen first for the voice of Jesus. Let's be doers of his word. Whatever he commands us to do, let's do that. And let's prepare ourselves for this time of transition between this life and eternity that God's going to do some mighty things. Uh, I want to be on the side that uh, understands his love and his mercy and his justice. Don't you? Yes. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for the privilege of delving into your word. And I thank you for a group of people who wants to hear what your word says. And though we cannot perfectly reveal all the things that you're saying here, we can reveal some of it. And we can be encouraged by what you say. So God, we thank you for your love and your mercy that has preceded us and which will follow us all the days of our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Just before we pray, we'd encourage you to look at the tables in the foyer as you go out and see what opportunities are there for you and uh, make, it, uh, make it a special point to understand that you're here, you fit in, you have a place of service. Let's pray. Well, Father, I want to thank you for this day, and I thank you for each person who has come. And I sense your great love for all of us, every individual in here, and no matter what we've done or where we've come from or what our current thinking is, you love everybody in this room. And it's an awesome love that you have poured out upon us. It's, it's nothing to be trifled with. It's, it's real. It's genuine. And I know that you love us where we are, but you also love us enough never to leave us where we are, but to lead us to where you would like for us to be. So God, we pray that if anybody's heart was touched here today, that they would feel free to have somebody pray with them to confess that they want more of Jesus or they just want to meet Jesus for the first time. I pray that they would be free enough to come and allow someone to pray with them. Thank you, Father, for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said, Amen.